So 14 days into my federal prison term, I was assigned to a job in the kitchen. And my job was scrub scrubbing pots and pans. As the new guy, I was like least last on the totem pole. So it was the worst job, the scrubbing. And I worked directly next to someone who had been in jail for 17 years. And naturally, when you're working alongside someone, you strike up some conversation. One thing you don't do in prison is offer unsolicited advice, ask, what are you here for? How long? Especially as the new prisoner, right? You're stepping into an environment where people have lived for weeks, months, and years. So I was very quiet, though one day he said to me, how long have you been in prison or how long was your sentence? And I said, you know, 18 months, because by then I realized 18 months was nothing in the federal prison system. It's just nothing. So since he asked me, I in turn said to him, uh, so uh, how long have you been in prison? He said, I've been here for nearly 17 years. I said, if I may say so, that's a long time. He's like, yeah, no kidding. Had I taken a plea agreement, I'd have been home in five. So I said, oh, you went to trial. He said, yes. I said, why? He said, you go to trial for three reasons. You're either not guilty, you are insane, or you're like me, delusional. You're convinced by a lawyer that you could prevail. And in many cases, I just I couldn't envision doing three or four or five years in prison. So I just rolled the dice hoping that I'd win. And I ended up getting 20 years because I went to trial. And it was such an enlightening conversation for me. And when I hear that, I think a lot about Elizabeth Holmes, who certainly could have accepted a plea agreement. And that plea agreement could have compelled her to testify or cooperate against Sonny Balwani, which would have led to a measurably shorter prison term because Ms. Holmes would have obtained, if she pled guilty, a coveted 5K1 letter, which is a cooperation agreement with the US government. And that cooperation agreement would have been a significant mitigating factor at her sentencing. Instead, like this long-term prisoner with whom I worked in the kitchen, she's rolling the dice, thinking she's going to prevail or hoping that her arguments that it was a Balwani's fault will prevail. Regardless, if she's convicted and the data suggests that she will be convicted because most people are convicted, it would be in her interest or any prisoner, any defendant's interest to begin preparing for the inevitable, which is, wow, I may be going to federal prison. And before going to federal prison, I'm going to face a federal sentencing hearing. So what I'm going to cover in this video is strategies or techniques that Ms. Holmes, frankly, any defendant, but Ms. Holmes could follow, even if she's convicted, which she could follow and implement today if she is convicted at trial and facing a sentencing hearing. Certainly some people on our Prison Professors channel or White Collar Advice channel, and by the way, if you're here on YouTube, we're so grateful for you're here. We know you're busy. Please like and subscribe. If you like what you're hearing, let us know. If you don't like what you're hearing, let us know. We just want to help and provide insights on this very interesting case. But a number of people have said, Justin, why are you posting videos about what she could expect in prison or what would happen if convicted? Well, it's just it makes a whole lot of sense. If the odds suggest she's going to get convicted, and uh, an old proverb says that the best day to plant an oak tree is 20 years ago and the second best day is today, it would make sense that Ms. Holmes or any defendant begins to prepare for the unlikely uh, scenario that she gets convicted and then she's going to face a sentencing hearing. So in that vein, I'm going to cover strategies she can follow to begin preparing for the shortest possible prison sentence. Note, I didn't say how to get out of prison early. At some point, I will film that video, though I touched on it recently in this video, what happens if she's convicted. In a separate later video, I'll cover how she can get out of prison early. For now, her goal, if convicted, will be how to mitigate, how to get the shortest possible sentence, and make this experience easier on those that love and support her. So let's get started. Elizabeth Holmes, in, in trying to get the shortest possible prison sentence, has to understand the sentencing guidelines. And I can assure you, she's going to spend a whole lot of time with her lawyers going through the sentencing guidelines. So let me go through a little uh, summary here to help you understand how the guidelines are going to factor into this sentence. According to the guidelines, the sentencing court considers seven key factors when determining the sentence to impose. Number one, the nature and circumstance of the offense and the criminal history of the defendant. Well, certainly it works, it helps her that there is no criminal history prior to this case. What will work against her is the reality that, according to the government, this fraud went on for a lengthy period of time. So Elizabeth Holmes' lawyers, if she's convicted, can argue, cannot, cannot argue, well, it was out of character, Your Honor. Uh, it was just a one-time thing, Your Honor. It was aberrational, Your Honor. Indeed, the government will argue her character is nothing more than to cheat and defraud. It's the only way she made money and became the youngest female billionaire by 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 stealing. 
So it's going to work against her how long this fraud went on. Number two, the need for the sentence imposed, reflecting on the four primary purposes of sentencing. Retribution. Well, certainly the retribution is for uh, the victims, people who lost money, regardless of how rich you know Betsy DeVos and, and Schultz and the Walton family may be, they're still victims and they lost money. I think what will have greater impact, including victims who will speak at, not just write letters, but speak at sentencing, if the judge allows them to speak at sentencing, the people who had hoped to benefit from this product that Theranos created, and in the, the wrong results of these tests that came back created stress and, and heartache in their life, it hurt people. So I think those victim impact statements and letters they write will be more impactful than the multimillionaires and billionaires um, who lost money. Uh, deterrence. Look, does Elizabeth Holmes need to be deterred in, in prison? Uh, and not from in her community. A lot of people argue she's sociopathic and saying, I'm not a psychologist, I don't know. But a lot of judges have to consider the deterrence factor. There are some people that if they are not in prison will continue to break the law, create harm and havoc. A number of people, the judge will say, well, I, you've been home for two or three or four years. You're living a law abiding life. You've built a new business. I don't think you're going to reoffend, but I need to send you to prison to make an example out of you to deter others from breaking the law. Her lawyers will argue she, there's no need for her to be in prison for the deterrence factor because she's not a threat to the community. And the government may agree or disagree with that, but they're going to say, Your Honor, we need to make an example out of her. People in Silicon Valley need to know what happens when you lie and cheat to grow a business, then fail to accept responsibility and blame other people. Incapacitation, but frankly, rehabilitation as well. I will tell you, because I served time in federal prison, that any growth in prison starts from within. Um, fully understanding how and why we got here it requires humility, it requires deference, it requires introspection. At least that was the case with me, recognizing there was no one to blame but me for my own troubles. Uh, she's not going to get rehabilitated from a federal prison program. I mean, these programs, most of them are useless. It's like you show up for the course. What's your first name, Elizabeth? What's your last name, Holmes? Are you a female? Yes. Great. You've graduated the course. Here's your certificate. So very few prisoners, I think, due to lack of programming in prisons, really get the rehabilitation they need. It usually comes from within, and it usually starts with saying, I blame no one but myself. Indeed, when I said that, my life began uh, to, to get better. It's it's humble. It's hard. But it, it's what it takes. If you did wrong, you should, uh, you should own it. Continuing on to some of these sentencing factors, the court is going to consider sentences available. The sentencing guidelines in her case, because of the losses and the victims, and because she hasn't accepted responsibility, it's going to call for an upward you know, departure, a much longer sentence. So probation in this case will not be um, will not even will not even be an option if she's continued. Let's get into specifically why there can be some upward departures and downward departures. And then I'm going to transition into specific things she can do to get a shorter federal prison sentence. So in understanding why the sentencing guidelines are going to recommend such a long sentence, we, we can't not cover why there'll be an upward departure. Number one, right, the extreme conduct by the defendant. The government's going to argue this went on for a long period of time and also endangering the public welfare by people who went into these stores accepting this product to make their life better. Instead, it created a lot of harm and havoc for them. So these is the reason there's going to be an upward departure, which means more than ever, she's got to mitigate. A concern for someone like Elizabeth Holmes who hires the most expensive lawyers and millions of dollars in legal fees is, the concern is all of the work is gonna be outsourced to a lawyer. And our experience interviewing judges, two of whom we interviewed on YouTube, they wanna hear from the defendant. The defendant has to do the lion's share of the work. And one thing that she can do if she's convicted, as crazy as it sounds, she could choose not to appeal her sentence. She could actually accept responsibility if she's convicted. Now, I know some of you have said she's sociopathic. She will continue to blame Balwani and others. It's never her fault. She's delusional. I will tell you, once you're convicted and you know, the odds of prevailing on an appeal are very low, when you're looking at 15 to 20 years in federal prison, it may compel you to do things differently. Now, even if it's opportunistic and she says, I'm sorry to try to get a shorter prison term because it could save the government our taxpayer dollars and having to prepare for an appeal, time that they can allocate to other cases. So we've had a number of clients of white collar advice who were convicted at trial and who chose not to appeal 
And the government said, we're going to give you a little bit of credit for that. And the judge did as well. It's never too late to accept responsibility. Those I said earlier in the video, the time to do it would have been now to cooperate against Belwani, get that 5K1 letter and so on. But she could absolutely choose not to appeal. And I believe would lead to a shorter prison term. Though I know a lot of you say it ain't ever going to happen. She ain't ever going to say she's wrong. Secondly, even if she does appeal and nothing that she should say or do should uh, jeopardize her judicial rights in the appeal. A lot of lawyers, I think, making the mistake of having their clients shut up and write or say nothing in a probation interview or a sentencing hearing under the idea that it's going to jeopardize their right to an appeal. I think that's wrong. What she can do to get a shorter federal prison term is actually just not focus on how her own life is imploding. And as a former white collar defendant who made a lot of bad decisions and hurt a lot of people initially because I was so self-absorbed with myself, I'll own that. I was focused on my own life. Elizabeth Holmes can focus on how her own life is imploding. She's sheltered in, even though it may be in a multi-million dollar estate. You have people like me filming YouTube videos to teach. And I do so in part to teach those who have made bad decisions, but also how to learn how to accept responsibility, because that's the only way back. If you've broken the law, to own it, to share what you've learned and to actually want to help people, but more so identify with victims. So what she shouldn't do is just talk about how her, her whole life is, is imploding and how people are out to get her and make fun of her and mock her. That doesn't work. To get a shorter prison term, you've got to identify with the victims. She's got to be able to say, even if she appeals, I don't believe I did anything wrong. In retrospect, it wasn't me. It was Balwani or it was just a failed business venture. There was no fraud here, but I do understand as a result of a company that I led, people have felt victimized and I identify with them and I am sorry for that. If she's ever willing to say, I'm sorry, I could have done things better or differently. She begins to get herself on the, the best path or germane to this video, how to get a, a shorter, for, shorter federal prison term. Something she should do if she wants a shorter federal prison term in my experience is own privilege and opportunities that she's had in life. I mean, let's embrace the reality that a number of people who end up in federal prison do not have educated parents that could fund to send, that could fund them to go to Stanford, that have people investing and believing in them at such a young age. I mean, she had opportunities and privilege that people can only dream of. You know what? So did I. And I didn't realize that until I got to prison. And had I recognized that earlier, instead of focusing on how my own life was falling apart, I'd have got a shorter prison term and the healing could have begun. So I would encourage her to own in front of the judge the privilege and opportunity she's had. I, I would beg her to do that and also not act like a victim, which she is not. Another thing a lot of defendants can do in preparing to get a shorter federal prison term is bring an expert witnesses to talk more about the overall character of the defendant along with issues they may have had throughout their life. So in this case, we know in the, the one of the three defenses that Elizabeth Holmes' team is pursuing is that it was Balwani and that there was post-traumatic stress disorder and being in a relationship with him, the way he abused her, I think, physically, uh, mentally, this Bengali offense that even if something was done wrong, she's not responsible because she was coerced to do it. So I can assure you with the big bucks the lawyers have, they will bring in expert witnesses to both write a letter and testify at sentencing that there are mitigating factors the court is not considering or needs to consider. And that can include mental health experts articulating to the extent of uh, what Balwani has done. Further, what they'll do, what good mitigation would do, is argue that whether she goes to prison or not, this will stain her for the rest of her life, that she has suffered significantly. Now, I don't think Miss Holmes can sell that. It's not on Miss Holmes to talk about how much pain and how hard this will be and being away from her, her baby and so on. Every person, every stakeholder has a role. That's for the experts, the counselors, the lawyers to sell. Miss Holmes should remain deferential, honest, and do so in a very thoughtful way that focuses on, on victims. But you can absolutely expect a mental health expert to both write a letter and speak at her sentencing and testing to the PTSD and focusing on her, her, uh, her overall character. Another thing that Ms. Holmes should do, if not already, is trying to engage in some community service work. Now, there are a lot of people who will say, well, no one would let her do community service work. That's absolutely not true. I can think of many organizations that would welcome her help, whether if not intellectually, maybe it's picking up trash or working on uh, business plans or doing something. But there is a way for her to contribute to her community. And in so doing, she should measure it. She should demonstrate how this community service work is impacting the lives uh, of other people. 
It's a big deal. Community service work, if done for the right reasons, judges don't like a defendant doing community service work three weeks before sentencing, then acting as if they have changed the world. Okay, continuing on. Something she could do to try to get the shortest federal prison term is pledge money, any income from a book or a movie, which is inevitable, right? Of Jordan Belfort, The Wolf of Wall Street, Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If, if You Can. Hey, look at me. I served 18 months for a miserable white collar crime. I got a book and I've done some TV stuff, which is kind of cool. Uh, if that's coming to me, who had like the most boring white collar crime case in the history of white collar crime, look at the attention that's coming her way. So if she could pledge uh, movie deals or book proceeds to the court, well, that can that money can go to the victims. That can help offset what will be a potentially billion dollar restitution order. And that could show some good faith to the government if it looks like she's not profiting off her case. So indeed, making a restitution payment at sentencing is a way to both get a shorter prison sentence, which I know she wants, but it's also a way to show the court that she's focused on the most important thing, which is what? It's victims. It's people that she hurt. Now, I know some people have called me called me crazy when I mention this right now because they say she wouldn't. Here's something that she can do if she really wants a shorter federal prison term. She should be working. Now, I know given the high nature of her case, she's not going to be able to drive for Uber or Lyft or deliver food for DoorDash, and she has a new baby. I understand all of that. But working and trying to create a new record in advance of sentencing is a golden nugget to try to get a shorter prison term. Why? Because if she were working somewhere, even from home, documenting what she's doing, documenting the hours, documenting what she's earning, documenting how she's providing value, it will show the judge that she can actually earn money as a law-abiding citizen. She can earn money without lying to Jim Cramer on mad money. She can actually earn money without putting a Pfizer logo that was stolen on letterhead and sending it off because she gave the impression that Pfizer validated their technology. Of course they didn't. So if she can work and make money, she can then show, look, I can do it. I can do it the right way. Look, to close, it all comes down to values. Everything we do in life is driven by our values. So does Elizabeth Holmes, is it of higher value to her to blame the government, to blame Balwani, to blame people like you and me? to claim that she's only being taken down because she was the youngest female billionaire. Is that of higher value to her? Certainly will lead to a much longer prison term, though it may make her feel better to continue to blame others. That could be of higher value than thinking about her family and her baby and recognizing this experience is harder on them. And lessons from prison, which you can get for free at White Collar Advice, do not buy the book. The book is free. At the end of chapter 18, Ethics, we wrote, would my decision mislead anyone or obscure truth? Could I justify my decision to my unborn child whom I wanted to consider me a man of honor? Would other judge my motivations and actions as being consistent with the concepts of integrity and of good citizenship? Before I went to prison, I did not consider those questions. I should have, and I paid a, a hard price for it, but really I hurt those that love and support me. I hope she makes the right decisions and prioritizes the victims and recognizes that she has an obligation and an opportunity to do better. If I can do it, if people can come back to my corner and give me a second chance because many believe I've earned it, if I can do it, there's no doubt she can do it as well. But now with humility and deference and introspection. With that said, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. Again, please like and subscribe. We're so grateful you give us your attention and time, and we will continue to work to prove worthy of it. Thank you again. Bye-bye.